Welcome to the Ostrom Avenue podcast. Syracuse is in a tough spot right now. The Orange just off two losses in a row to Duke and Pittsburgh. And here to talk about it with myself, Ben Schulman, we got Johnny Gadamowitz, Ethan Frank, and Syracuse.com's Mike Waters is in the building. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Technically, technically not in the building, but in the podcast, right? Yeah, here we go. So. Yes. But no, happy who, to who join you guys. No one's ever in the building these days anymore anyway. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's all it's all figure of speech now. But we have Mike joining us uh, with Dick Vitale alongside him. And uh, essentially, you know, as our regular listeners know, we're, we'd usually talk about the last games a bit. Then we're going to preview the next one with a guest. But coming off those losses and where Syracuse is, we think it's a time to zoom out a bit because this is – crazy the orange just lost by 20 and it was really 30 to duke and then suffered a double digit loss to pittsburgh and they're in a lot of trouble mike i i think we have to start with a theme that was brought up a lot after the duke game on our post game show the double overtime this team so much worse at least in the results than last year's team is that as simple as you lose quincy allen braswell kadari and the guys you brought in weren't good enough to replace them in Swider, Jimmy, and Saimir? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, what, what else are we going to base this on, if not personnel? Um, you know, they lost a lot of athleticism off last year's team, with Quincy and Allen especially. And, and Braswell was maybe not in, as incredible of an athlete, but long and really good at the back of the zone. Uh, and the guys they replaced them with are good basketball players, but they're not anywhere near as athletic as those guys. And we all knew it was going to be a little bit, bit of a problem. I'll admit, I think I underestimated uh, how big of a problem it was going to be prior to the season. Um, I thought with their, their height and their length, coupled with their basketball IQs, you know, we were talking Cole Swider's a fourth year player, Jimmy Bayheim's in his fourth or fifth year, um, you know, of college basketball, that they were going to be not great on defense, but they would figure out ways to be okay. Well, they haven't. And uh, not being able to get out the shooters, uh, you know, I really think it's the defensive end of the floor that's got this team, you know, where they're at right now at nine and 11 overall. Um, they're just not good enough defensively. Teams are getting shots. And even when teams aren't making shots right away, they're getting them. Uh, like Pittsburgh the other night, I think they were one of 14 from three in the first half. And they're not a great three point shooting team, but they're not one for 14 bad. Right. But they were getting those threes and they weren't all bad looks or contested shots. They were there. And then, you know, what happens is, is teams don't stop shooting threes anymore. We're in a new era now of, of basketball. Pittsburgh in the second half goes six of 12 from three point range. Well, six of 12 is going to get you beat. And that's happening a lot this season to Syracuse. Teams are shooting threes at a very high rate, high volume, and it's just way too much for this team. So here we are. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. You know, beyond sort of, you know, the personnel and, and who, who's out from last year and who's new in this year, how much of, of this season and sort of how it's gone astray are you pinning on any sort of, Bayheim coaching scheme style, you know, the zone not holding up in the ACC as much as it used to. How, how big of a, of a part does that play? Yeah, I'll admit I'm not a huge fan of the zone. Uh, never really was, but it was hard to argue against its success when you're in 2009, 2010, 2013, when the zone was also being played by better players. And the game hadn't changed. You know, I, I sort of alluded to it a, a minute ago. There's no longer the days where teams have two shooters on the floor and, you know, maybe a point guard who drives a lot and a forward who wants to just be in the low post along with the center. Um, you know, now teams are taking the floor, you know, if they're any good at all. And if they're in a, if they're an ACC team, they're decent, right? Um, there's no terrible teams in the ACC compared to the rest of the country, you know, you, these teams are, have, they, they got three shooters minimum. 
you know, or, you know, sometimes they've, they've got, if they don't have a guy in their starting lineup, they've got a guy coming off the bench who shoots it. You know, Pittsburgh the other night, Pittsburgh again is not a great team, but they've got a six foot 10 guy in Mo Gee who likes to go out and shoot threes and he's good at it, you know? So you're the zone now, you know, Jim Behan's tried to tweak it to, to adjust to the new game. You know, we, we're, you've got those forwards coming out further and further where, you know, sometimes, you know, I've, we've got still shots of, of how they look. Sometimes it looks like they're playing a four, one, you know, the two guards the forwards are up almost as high as the guards. And it's just the center who's back. And, you know, he tweaked it earlier this year, trying to go with that one, three, one, or almost more of a, of a one, one, three look. Uh, it was, you know, moving a guard to the high post and listen, that's all well and good, but, you know, when you look at Ken Pomeroy's website, you know, KenPom.com, and you see that Syracuse's opponents this year are taking more of their overall field goals from three-point range than everybody else in the country except for one other team. You know, you never want to be on the extreme, right? Especially, you know, defending and how teams are attacking you. Um, you know, 50% of other team shots are coming from three-point range. You know, eventually, it's not just the percentage of makes, it's just the volume of them. You know, you're, you're just giving up way too many points from three-point range. Eventually, when another team catches fire in a game, you risk that run that just turns the game. And, yeah, so I don't love the zone, but, you know, they wouldn't be this bad if they had better players, too. You know, if, if you had, going back to 2010, you know, if you had Wes Johnson, Rick Jackson, and uh, you know, whoever else, you know, Renzi on a at center, this zone wouldn't look as bad. I still think teams would be attacking it in today's style and it wouldn't be quite as effective, but you'd be better. I mean, 2013 with Michael Carter Williams at the top of the zone, looking completely different than anybody else you have on this roster. Um, so yeah, you could still play it, but you got to have better players. Jumping off of that, it, it felt like Beheim, Coach Beheim, almost admitted to that yesterday when he went on uh, went on Q Sports Talk and said, "Yeah, you know, I haven't coached as well, and I haven't recruited as well as I've needed to for us to be successful." So, have you ever heard him ever say anything like that, especially during the middle of a season when he is basically admitting, "Yet yeah, this is all my fault, and I am the one to blame for all these problems." I've heard it on occasion when he's been frustrated with the team, you know, maybe, but not, not ever, obviously with a nine and 11 record. Usually uh, you get that when it's four and four, just eight games into the season, like in 2017, um, a few other times, maybe when he's frustrated with the team and you, you, yeah, and he's always taken responsibility, maybe not as, you know, you know, publicly as he did on, on the radio shows uh, of this week. Uh, but I think that's in reaction to a lot of fan frustration out there too. And, you know, he's aware of it. He senses it. Um, so he's going to take it on, but yeah, listen, guys, we're in uncharted waters here, right? I mean, none of this is, I think that's why you get, you know, Jim Beheim that you had yesterday on the radio shows. And I think it's why you're getting the fans running around with their hair on fire. Um, they're just, this is, this doesn't happen at Syracuse there. There's frustration. There's uh, panic. Um, you know, they don't know how to handle this. They've never experienced it before unless they're about 70 years old and they were around in 1969, right? Uh, the last time Syracuse had a losing record um, and before either of you youngsters ask, no, I did not cover that team. Uh, so don't even go there. I've had a couple of you in class. I can want at least one in class. I can go back and adjust grades if we go there. Um, <laughs> So, no, I think, you know, you got fans who don't know what to do. And listen, to to be honest, there's been a building frustration level of fans ever, you know, over the last five, six, seven years. They're not used to Syracuse going 10 and 10 in conference play. You know, they're not used to the 8 and 10, 9 and 7 conference play. They're, you know, Syracuse fans who have been around more than a decade, you know, they're, they're used to, you know, the way things were in the Big East and things have changed. Uh, the ACC's not been, a, a, you know, I think it's pretty obvious. It's not been a great move for the, for the health of the basketball program on the court anyway, maybe money-wise. I think the stability of the athletic department is good because of the move. Um, 
but listen, basketball's got it tougher now. You're, you're, you're not in the league where you have your history. You're not in the league where you built your brand. If you're recruiting kids out of New York and New Jersey who grew up wanting to play in the Big East, well, now you're convincing them to play in the ACC instead of playing at all those Big East schools that are closer to home. Or if it's a Washington, D.C. area kid that grew up wanting to play in the ACC, well, you're convincing him to come six and a half hours north instead of maybe playing at Virginia, Virginia Tech, uh, you know, even, you know, North Carolina is, is a closer drive. And, man, you know, even if the drive's about the same, you're driving south in the better weather, right? So I think it's been a tough go. And I think that's what there's another segment of fans out there that are like, where is this program headed? Not so much where we are right now, but, you know, they're looking at, you know, year over year here for the past six or seven years. And I think that's where there's some concern. We're speaking with Mike Waters, writer for Syracuse.com, my former professor who I hope does not change my grade. <laughs> uh, and uh, talking about, you know, just just kind of this free fall that Syracuse is in. And and what you just said, Mike, is I think what really inspired this episode is it's it's a little bit about this season, but it's a lot about, you know, the next five seasons or the next 10 seasons. And I made a, a comparison on Twitter that some people liked and some didn't, uh, that, that this program is becoming Temple in front of our eyes. Temple, you know, dominated the 80s and dominated the 90s and had a little bit of success in the 2000s. They, you know, they cracked a little bit earlier than maybe Syracuse is, but then they also switched conferences in, in 2013 and have really not done anything since, you know, two two NCAA tournament appearances, and one of them was just in the first four. Is that fair? Am I way off off the path here? Or, you know, could we see a, a program like Temple, who was once renowned, turn into one where people, you know, don't pay that much attention to it anymore? You know, that's it's an interesting comparison, and it's one more bear that bears looking at, and I think it will get some people's attention for sure. Um, I think, you know, when I say people's attention, I think people up at Syracuse University need to be really concerned right now at where they are, and whether you don't want to become Temple, that might be a little bit far, and there's some differences, but, you know, you look at the struggles Maryland has had since leaving the ACC and going to the Big Ten. I think, I think we can draw very you know, you know, similar comparisons between Syracuse and Maryland. Um, the thing you have to remember with Syracuse is, you know, Syracuse is still in a really good conference. You know, they're not in the Big East where they built their brand and where they have their history, but they're still in a very good league. It's still a recognizable name. You know, it's not going to be like Temple fading into the a10 or wherever they're at and you know and temple straddled the lines there for a few years where they had football in one league the big east and they had basketball in another and you know listen i think T temple was always a tenuous situation to me because um you, you know you're one of five or six schools competing at the d1 level in philadelphia you're not villanova which is in the big east and has really risen above you now uh you know you're occupying a similar league with some other philly rivals and, and so much of their success was built on John Chaney. Now, how much of Syracuse's success is built on Jim Beheim is probably your next question, right? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's interesting right now. It's like you look at the decline and you're like, is Jim Beheim holding everything together and keeping it from being worse? Temple? Or at some point, is Syracuse going to have to address its future without Jim Beheim? Um, is, is it hard right now to, to maintain a level of success when you have a 77 year old coach? Listen, I'm not saying, you know, Jim Bayhan doesn't know how to coach anymore or can't do it or whatever, but you know, in recruiting, other schools are killing them for his age. And it's not fair. It's terrible. I don't like it. It's ageist. As I get older, I'm going to hate it worse. Um, you know, but you know, it's happening because, you know, in recruiting, people recruit negatively all the time. There, I mean, there's some scary stories out there about, you know, coaches telling, you know, or hinting that another coach has cancer or, you know, is, uh, you know, God, there's a famous tale about one coach in the Big East trying to put out a rumor that, that another coach was gay. I mean, they're recruiting guys, I can't tell you how seedy the game can get. You think there's not a coach out there saying Jim Beheim 77 when it's the truth? You know, when, when they'll lie about other things? Of course. So I don't, you know, 
I don't know. I, 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 I hate saying that anybody should have to retire because of their age when I still think they can do the job. But, you know, it, it, listen, at some point, though, yeah, the university is going to have to confront a future without Jim Beha. And where are they going to go there? And, you know, what are the discussions going to be? Are the discussions are, are, are we hiring in-house? Is it going to be one of the current assistant coaches? Are we, you know, is that where we're going to go? It worked last time. You know, Jim Beheim was an assistant for Roy Danforth, and it's worked in other places. And you see Duke and Carolina going with current assistants who played at that school, right? At some schools, that's really important. Or do you know what? Does this program need a jump start? You know, um, do you need to break glass in case of emergency and call Rick Pitino at, I at Iona? You know, he was on Jim Beheim's original coaching staff back in the 70s. Um, you know, do, or do you, are you looking for the next Nate Oates, you know, when he was at Buffalo and, you know, might have been a guy that you think of, but, you know, now he's at Alabama. So, no, you're not hiring a Nate Oates. He's, I think he's way past your pay scale probably at this point. But you know, are you finding that guy? Uh, you know, I don't know. But I think these are questions that are probably being asked in some meeting rooms up there on, on the hill. But, you know, I don't know what the answers are. Well, Mike, you know, you're sort of in a way going to going to ask you to the best of your ability to, to answer the, your own questions that you just pose. You know, when push comes to shove, is this something that you think could be happening in, in the near immediate future? And given everything we know at this point in time, how likely is it you think they stay in house or is it kind of that fresh start mindset? You know, I, I don't know that guys, that's a really tough question. You know, I know it's intriguing to look out there and try to find, you know, a, a guy who can come in from outside, you know, and Nate Oates and obviously Nate Oates was a great hire for Alabama. Right. So, uh, you know, there might be somebody out there. I tell you what, though, there, there, there is advantages and benefits to hiring, you know, somebody within the quote unquote family. You know, and whether it's Adrian Autry or Jerry McNamara, Alan Griffin, or, you know, one of those guys, um, you know, it's, it's the stability and, you know, you, you keep your fan base or at least most of it, they like it. I tell you what, too, the, the alums, meaning the basketball player alums, you're going to have to really convince a lot of really important guys why they're not hiring their former teammates. You know, whether it's Jerry or Allen or Red or, you know, whoever, you know, what, wait, those guys were there for how long, put in their dues, did all this, waited their time. And you're going to go out and hire somebody from Bowling Green, you know, tell me why, um, you know, explain that to Derek Coleman, Billy Owens and Lawrence Moton, you know, guys that matter around here, you know, that, um, that they really value that. And, and you want those guys coming back. Right. Um, you know, I, Again, like I said earlier, I think it's certain programs that matters. And now, you know, Duke hired John Shire. You know, we'll see how that goes. Hubert Davis, you know, how will Syracuse fans when Syracuse has a season like North Carolina's having in, in Adrian Autry's first year? You know, it's like, it's not going great right now for North Carolina by their standards either. I think they're good, but um, they're, they've had their struggles too, right? So I, I don't know. I I think the only guy, I'll be very honest with you, I think the only guy that I would hire that is not from the current staff that I think would work would be Patino. Now, you're going to have to get some people up there at the administrative level to be okay with that. You know, he's he's got some skeletons in that closet, but man, um, the cachet that he would bring as a sh basically short-term hire, um, that... That might be enough, but, you know, personally, I, you know, I, I think you got a couple guys on your current staff that can run a basketball program. There, there are two key points that I, I, I believe you just said that are really intriguing to me. One, when you said there's one person on the, not on the current staff that you were hired, I thought you were going to say Mike Hopkins and Hop, he, he, uh, and let's just say his Washington tenure has not gone as probably he had hoped, or it looked better when he started there. They made an NCAA tournament. They lost to North Carolina. Or did they beat North Carolina or they lose to North Carolina? I don't remember, but they were in the tournament. Beat them. Yeah. yeah. And 
Hop is a guy who was supposed to be the next coach and, and that did not end up happening. So would you say that Hop is someone who should be completely eliminated from this discussion? And then the second part of that is there's the argument that if you're going with someone from outside the family, that it's almost disrespectful to what Coach Beheim has done to the program in that you're going to go and say, Jim, you've been the coach for 45 plus years, and now we're just going to completely take someone from the outside and disrespect everything you've done for the program in that your 45 year, more than 45 years are meaningless because the end was bad when you have all the good that came in the first 40 or so years. So, so what, what are your thoughts on, on both of those two things? All right. I'll, 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 I'll address the latter first. Um, Listen, making a coaching hire has nothing to do with respect or disrespect to the previous guy. you got to hire somebody good. And whoever is making that call has to be very comfortable with it. Um, you know, if the person making that call is extremely comfortable with one of the current staffs, great. That's awesome. And you go with that guy. But if you're not comfortable, listen, if you're John Wildhack or Ken Severud or one of the board of trustees, and you're like, you know what? We're just not comfortable there. We'd rather have somebody with head coaching experience or whatever your reason is. That's not a disrespect to Jim Behan. It No. So no, you have to take those kind of feelings out of it. It's, it's okay. I mean, Alabama wasn't disrespecting Wimp Sanderson when it hired Nate Oates or, you know, whoever followed who, right. Um, you, you go with whoever's going to get you there again. So, but you have to be comfortable. Out. So I know I, I wouldn't say it would be disrespect, but I think there are some factors involved where you have to think about it. Like I said, do you want to lose? some of your alums and the support of the Derek Coleman's and Billy Owens is and guys like that who they won't be happy. Uh, so, and then the Mike Hopkins question, guys, man, that's a tough one. Um, you're going to have to convince some people that it's okay to hire a guy who has struggled in his last three, four years at Washington. Um, they're, I think they're nine and eight going into last night or tonight. So, uh, and of course the last couple of years have been rough. I, I, I got to wonder if Syracuse missed its window or its opportunity for Mike Hopkins when they let him get out of here. You know, the agreement that after the 2015 season that Jim Behan was going to coach three more years might have been just too big of a window. And uh, maybe it should have been shorter so that you didn't risk losing Mike Hopkins if that was your guy. Uh, by giving him that three-year gap, there was time to think about it. There was time for other schools to come in and poach him. It's almost like watching a recruit commit to a college at the end of their freshman year of high school. There's plenty of time for other schools to come in and say, you know what? Uh, our offense coordinator here is better or, or we run, you know, whatever. So this time, man, it's, I, I think he should be, you could consider it because I tell you what, I think Mike would be more successful here at Syracuse than he was going to be at Washington. He had for 20 years recruited this area of the country for Syracuse and built his ties here. Um, I, I think he would have had a much easier time still being at Syracuse where he made his brand, by the way, already. And, and, and his recruiting connections are closer to here. Would have been nice to see Isaiah Stewart in a Syracuse uniform. That's what I'm saying, but I don't know. I don't know if you can bring him back. I mean, you're going to have to leapfrog, right? So, and convince people that it's okay to bring in a guy who in his last three years has basically a 500 or a sub 500 record. That's a tough sell. In a league that many would argue, at least until this year, is probably less competitive too uh, than the ACC. Although they have good teams out on the West Coast. You mentioned recruiting. That'll be a big focus of the off season, but I don't want to start necessarily there. Uh, the transfer portal, of course, as we zoom back in on this season with Mike Waters to Syracuse.com, it, it's going to be a discussion. It, it might not be as easy as last year where people already kind of had some ideas of who was going and who was staying midseason. But what do you think Syracuse needs to look for in this upcoming cycle? And maybe who do you think from the roster could be on the way out? Man. Um, uh, that's a tough question to really answer, um, accurately. Cause we really don't know. And I, I don't like to guess on guys leaving. It's, um, something just doesn't feel right about that. You know, um, 
I, I, last year at this time, I never would have thought Quincy Gary A is leaving. You know, who saw that coming in last January? Nobody. I mean, I was, that's crazy. Just, I still don't know why he left. Um, I think some people put some bad ideas into his head, you know, and uh, he, list, he listened to the wrong people. Um, and he would have been a big help. What Syracuse does in the transfer portal this spring will depend a lot on not just like guys leaving off this program, you know, off, off this roster to, to hit the portal themselves. But there's three guys who are going to have to make decisions on whether they come back or not that doesn't have anything to do with transferring. Buddy Beheim technically could take an extra year here. Now, he has said it's really not his plan right now. But what you plan in January might not be what you do in late March, right? Um, Cole Swider, he can come back. Now, he entered this season saying it really wasn't his plan. That he kind of thought he would just be a one-year guy here at Syracuse. But, you know, because of the way the season's gone and, and everything, who knows what he might start thinking in March. And a lot of this will have to do with, you know, conversations between him and maybe his parents or and, and also the Syracuse coaches. Then you got Jimmy Beheim. Now, again, Jimmy Beheim says that he's pretty much ready to go. Uh, he's going to have a very long college career, five years and four playing seasons. But at some point, some former Ivy League athlete is going to challenge this NCAA rule and get the extra year that everybody else in college sports got that the Ivy League kids didn't, not just in basketball, but every sport. Now, will Jimmy be that guy? I don't know. Maybe it's the Atkinson, Atkinson kid at Notre Dame. Uh, but, you know, some Ivy League kid is eventually going to get that extra year back. I don't know if it's Jimmy, but depending on what those three guys do, I think will dictate guys on the current roster deciding to stay or go. And also it dictates on your needs in the portal as well. So because I don't know what Cole and Jimmy and Buddy are going to do, I can't answer your question, guys. <laughs> Mike, we mentioned before uh, uh, Coach Beheim on the radio show last night and, you know, taking, taking some accountability. He also mentioned, you know, just sort of on the topic of the future that, you know, he could see a scenario where, you know, next year you got two to three freshmen coming in starting. How realistic do you do you see that scenario playing out? Who who might those guys be? What did you sort of make of of that segment of the show we did last night? Yeah, I heard that. And um I could see where maybe that was the plan or the idea when you started recruiting some of these kids, but I gotta tell you, man, that that's a little that's a little concerning if you ask me. I mean, I've only seen one of the four kids play in person, live and in person, and that was Chris Bunch. Um, and he's a nice springy athlete. He's got to get a lot stronger. He's got a nice shot. It didn't help on the day I went to see him that he was 0 for 5 from three-point range. I mean, I watched the form. He can shoot. He just didn't make that day. But you know, none of these incoming recruits are McDonald's All-Americans. None of them are top 20 locks to like, yeah, he's going to be fine at the college level. We're, we're talking guys who at best are ranked. I don't know. I think Chris Bunch, not in ES, none of them are in the top 100 for ESPN. None. I think Chris Bunch is around in the 50s for one of the other recruiting websites. Now, a kid rating 50 could come in and contribute. But that's only one of the five. And he was talking two or three starting. That's gonna be a that's gonna be a, a very young team. And I don't I don't know about that. Um I, I just don't know how good that team can be because but you do have to look at it. Joe Girard's probably starting next season. You hope Jesse Edwards is back and starting next season. Is Benny Williams take that leap? And is he into the starting lineup next season? You're still looking to three fill two starting spots. And maybe it's going to have to be one or two of the freshmen. Um, but yeah, people are worried about this year. You know, ne next year could be interesting too. And that's why, I, you know, uh, people got really upset when, uh, when Jim Beheim about two weeks ago, just casually mentioned on his radio show that, yeah, they might look into that waiver with the NCAA and try to get Jimmy another year. And people were mad. I'm like, are you kidding me? Why would you be mad with your, like, at the time, second leading scorer, third leading rebounder, or third leading scorer, second leading rebounder returning? Listen, some of these people need to get, you know, a little bit less hung up on kids' last names and who their dads are 
and look at like what you got coming in and what you got coming back and thinking to yourself, you know what? It may not be such a bad thing to have Jimmy Beheim back next year or Cole Swider. You know, we'll, you know, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, yeah, next next season, I don't know. It could be an interesting team. I'm I'm intrigued. I'm always I'm always fascinated because it's it's real easy just to like you know when you're not a fan. You don't run around panicked and with your hair on fire and, and mad at everybody. It's like, you know, when you're a writer just covering a team, this everything's fascinating to me. And, you know, I, I listen, I hate it for the kids on the team. And I don't, you know, I got a lot of friends that are fans. I don't, I, I can see what they're going through. I don't like it for them either, but my goodness. So uh, we're, yeah, we are definitely seeing a season that's historically bad. And you had to go back about 50 years to, to find one worse. I, I think the point you just made is really interesting about Jimmy and Cole and, and what coach Beheim said last night is Jimmy would have been happy coming in and coming off the bench and playing 15 to 20 minutes a game with Quincy starting because that's what he assumed was going to happen that Quincy would have come back. Uh, he talked about Robert Braswell that he Braswell could have spelled Cole with Cole's shooting struggles to start the season. And I think that's the real problem is that, Jimmy and Cole were probably not meant to be guys playing 30 to 35 minutes every night. And that's the situation they put themselves in because of the guys who decided to transfer and go other places. And as you mentioned, Quincy is not playing as well at Oregon as he did at Syracuse. Coach Beheim mentioned Robert is not playing as well as Charlotte as he has at Syracuse. And that's really the crux of the issue and, and even on top of that, the waiver question, the returning question, Coach Beheim, when he was talking about the freshman starting, named 10 guys that he thought would be back next season and did not mention Buddy, Cole, or Jimmy. He said Joe, Symeer, the five freshmen, Benny, Jesse, and Frank. So you're kind of seeing, it feels like Coach Beheim might be playing both sides a little bit, where you have Cole, who also went on the radio and said, I haven't made up my mind what I'm going to do yet. Maybe I'll be back. Maybe I won't. You know, Jim, as you said, mentioning, you know, maybe Jimmy will pursue the waiver. So if you had to guess right now, who, would you would you say that those three guys are back? Or would you say, you know, it's a very different looking Syracuse team next year? I think at most you're going to get what, just one of those three guys back. I don't know which one it'll be, but I would say at most one. So it's going to be a very different looking team. Yes. Yeah. You know, and you go back to that last year stuff about, you know, yeah, man, it would, I, again, I don't know what exactly Quincy was looking for in, in leaving. I, it may be a coach that was going to let him shoot more threes. If that was really it. Oh man. Sometimes it's not always good to have somebody let you do what you're not good at. Um, you know, he's a much better looking player, uh, you know, in the eyes of an NBA scout when he's doing his strong suits. Right. So, but it's hard to talk to kids. You know, I, I'm sure Quincy and Robert and some of those kids were like listening to what they were being told and then going, yeah, right. Like you're not playing Jimmy over me or yeah, right. Like you're not, you know, I, I'm sure Robert Braswell didn't think he was going to get as much playing time as maybe the coaches were telling him he were. And I'm sure Quincy was thinking to himself too. I mean, it's hard. I mean, Doug Gottlieb mentioned it in a podcast about a little bit of a week ago that, you know, when you have your own kids on the team that, you know, other kids are out there, you know, thinking, Oh no, buddy's going to get all the shots. I don't want to go there. You know, you can't recruit another guy who wants to be a big time scorer for a couple of years. I don't know if it's true or not, but again, with recruiting, it's probably what a lot of these kids were being told was going to happen by other coaches, you know? So it's tough. It's really tough. It's, it's charged. It's, hard to change people's minds once they start to believe once they start to believe something like Kadari Richmond like, I'm sure thought he was never going to get a fair shot here it seems like Oregon's doing a pretty good job of uh of telling people that they might not get what they want at Syracuse if you want a little Dior Johnson content in this crisis episode uh but Mike you know we're we're, we're wrapping up here and, and we've had the pleasure of doing I think north now of 30 minutes with Mike Waters from Syracuse.com, and it's been you know, a lot of negative. They're, they're, they have a shot. At least Ken Palm would say they're going to go below 500 for the first time since Woodstock, and they look like they might not be an NIT team, and the Bayheims could be on the way out, and there's a lot of freshmen that could start. Is, is there a positive? Like what? <laughs> when you go to bed at night and you're clutching your pillow as a Syracuse men's basketball fan, 
what's going to put someone to sleep? Is there something that we can give someone here to say it's not all bad and, you know, we're not in Chernobyl right now? Okay. Um, listen, this season's tough already. And at 9 and 11, I don't know how much I can make it look better. But let's look ahead to next year. And where I, you know, I was talking about that recruiting class before. You know, I wasn't really, you know, wild about seeing more than one or two of them start. But those five kids in that class, to me, look like a really good foundational class. There's not a kid in it that's like coming in thinking he's one and done. I don't know how you could think that if you're not in the, you know, McDonald's All-American or top 50 in your class. So, but between Chris Bunch, uh, Peter Carey, Malik Brown, Justin Taylor, and, and Quadir Copeland, you've got a player at all five positions and all of them appear to have a lot of really good upside, a lot of really good qualities. They may not be in the top 50 in the country because you know, Quadir doesn't quite shoot it as well as you'd like, but he's still six foot six and a real flashy point guard who handles the ball great. Chris Bunch may not be a McDonald's All-American because he's a little thin and the shot's a little inconsistent, but, and, and his defense could, could do some work, but you put a six foot seven, six foot eight athletic guy in the zone. Well, I'm not so much worried about the little man, the man on the ball defense anymore. And, and believe me, his shot looks good. Um, Justin Taylor looks like a really fine all around ball player. And, you know, you hope that the two bigs, uh, Malik Brown and Peter Carey are going to be the kind of bigs that develop, you know, Jesse Edwards didn't give you a lot as a freshman, but look at him now, right? Um, you know, we've seen this before with young big kids. So, uh, you know, I think it's a class that could have Syracuse pointed in the right direction. And, you know, they'll have to make some moves to make sure next year isn't as bad as this. And when I say moves, there might be some transfer portal moves that are going to help the look of next year's team. But, um, yeah, yeah the future isn't all bleak and those five kids in that class uh i i think can have this program back going again within a couple of years yeah i i think a, a big thing to look at is you know is teams rebound you know duke for other reasons and it's a way different scale but they had a down year last year they're back north carolina i'm sure within a year or two will be contending at the national level again there's an opportunity for Syracuse to make this uh, the worst of a pretty good bunch if the Orange can stop the momentum at some point. If it turns into multiple years, mm -hmm. that's when you start buying Temple Owls posters and turning on whatever song was number one on the charts in 1983. But, Mike, thank you so much for, for coming. And at least I think explaining and easing our tensions a little bit uh, in, this, in this crisis episode for Syracuse. Well, it's uh, certainly new times around here. So, uh, yeah, I get the conversation. It's fun to have it. Guys, thanks for uh, bringing me in and, and having a little chat with you. It was a lot of fun. We will be back on the air for Syracuse men's basketball coming up tomorrow. That is 8 p.m. Saturday versus Wake Forest. Countdown to tip off starts at 7.30. But for Johnny Gadamowitz, Ethan Frank, and Mike Waters, I'm Ben Schulman saying thank you so much, and we'll see you next week.